Good morning. We're in Matthew chapter 5. Please turn there. And particularly as we go through the Beatitudes, I hope uh, it hasn't been too stilted. But so because of that, I want to begin this morning with just a very quick reminder of some principles which ought to guide us as we study these Beatitudes. First, there is an internal logical order to the Beatitudes, and the foundational premise is given in the first, in verse 3, that the truly blessed person is one characterized by a poverty of spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And this is not some kind of downtroddenness that Jesus has in mind, but the right understanding that we are sinners in need of a Savior, and the only thing we bring in our relationship to God is our sin, and any blessing that we meet with in life is his gift of grace to us. That's the foundational presupposition of the Beatitudes, and it leads directly to the blessed conditions that follow, that such people as that will mourn over their sin, that they'll have a right understanding of themselves and that they are meek and therefore content with God's blessing upon them and not dependent upon the good commendation of others and what other people think of them or say about them. And consequently, they're driven to hunger and thirst for the thing that they don't have, which is a righteousness. And That, of course, allows them to show mercy because they understand that they've been shown mercy. Matthew's emphasis in his gospel, remember, is on the kingdom of God and Christ's arrival into our world as the king who will reign over that kingdom. And in these Beatitudes, Christ instructs us on what are the characteristics of those who will be citizens in his kingdom. They provide a description of what Christians ought to look like. We can see in these Beatitudes what you and what I should look like, how we should appear to the world. The qualities laid out reveal who we are and what is inside us. They reveal what God truly has done in our hearts and why consequently the Lord can say that such persons are, as these are the blessed. You may remember the sermon ends with a parable about good trees and bad trees. Every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. You will know them by their fruits. The tree, Jesus said, is known by its fruit. So we have in the Sermon on the Mount a cheat sheet of sorts. I said that at the beginning, a cheat sheet of sorts to help us discern what is really in our hearts. And the answers are found in the fruit uh, that we bear. And so now we come to the sixth and seventh Beatitudes. So let's read them there in verses 8 and 9 in Matthew chapter 5. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God, or daughters of God, children of God. Well, we want to understand what it means uh, to be pure in heart. And so to do that, we need to consider the terms. We need to understand what these terms is. Uh, The concept of the heart uh, is extremely important in the Bible. You know that. You read your Bibles a lot. Uh, The writers of Scripture, uh, more to the point, uh, the one who puts these words into the mouths or the pens of the writers of Scripture Uh, emphasize that the heart is more than just an an organ that pumps blood throughout the human body. It's more than that. The word is most commonly used to represent the the entirety of a person, uh, not just the motions, uh, not just the will, not just the intellect, but all three of those. You know, we speak of the desires of our heart, And we mean that as a kind of visceral uh, 
emotional longing that we have. Uh, we speak of having a, a heart to pursue something, a, a hobby or a sport, and we mean that's something that we will to do, we want to do it. But generally speaking, when the Bible speaks or presents the heart, it's meant to stand for the entire personality, everything there is about the person. Now, the Bible also teaches that the heart is the arena of all our troubles. Uh, Jeremiah uh, says it, the heart is more deceitful than all else. It's desperately sick. Who can understand it? That's how unfathomably uh, difficult and sick it is. Uh, the Lord Jesus knew that. He warned against it. He spoke a great deal about the heart. You go look at Jesus' teachings, and he talks about the heart. He spoke about the heart, especially to the religious people of his day who tended to have it all wrong and thought that outward deeds and the image of propriety were all that was required for God's approval. But Jesus knew that was not the case. Uh, Matthew uh, records that incident in, in Matthew chapter 15, you'll recall, in which the Pharisees were all bent out of shape because the disciples of Jesus hadn't washed their hands according to the ritual uh, re, uh, 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 laws. And the Lord uh, rebuked those Pharisees, saying the things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and those defile the man, for out of the heart come evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, slanders. So when the Lord Jesus speaks of uh, being pure in uh, heart, he means to point to every pore of our being, our mind, our will, our emotions, all that we are uh, as his creature. It's what King David understood uh, painfully uh, when he had fallen into sin and he had committed those heinous acts with Bathsheba and against her husband. In Psalm 51, uh, in desperation, David cry, cried out, Create in me a clean heart, O God. In other words, make me something different with that, than what I've come to understand I am. Create in me a clean heart. Well, then there's this word, uh, pure. Uh, blessed are the pure in heart. Our first impulse, I think, when we hear the word pure is to think of that cleanness of thought and conduct that is not tainted by the impurity of sin and the pollution of the world, but rather is in conformity with God's will for us and his ethical demands for us. This was the distinction uh, between Cain and Abel uh, that met with uh, two very different responses uh, from the Lord. Uh, he accepted, remember, the sacrifice that Abel brought, but rejected Cain's. And wh while we may debate uh, exactly what it was that pleased or displeased the Lord on that occasion in regard to these sacrifices they made, there's no doubt about God's position in relation to the two uh, brothers, he said to Cain, you've probably read this week, this week, because you've started reading through the Bible uh, through the year, but this is Genesis 4. God said to Cain, if you do well, your countenance will be lifted up. But if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door, and its desire is for you. Uh, this, so this is moral purity and moral impurity, uh, doing well before God, or as the case may be, not doing well. One is clean, the other is dirty. It is not pure. We were in uh, New York over Christmas. We have a son there, most of you know. The married kids were with the in-laws, and the youngest son lives in New York City, so uh, we were also had some of Cindy's family there as well. And on the day after Christmas, uh, we, we spent the day, Cindy and I did, with him in uh, Brooklyn. He lives in, in Brooklyn. Uh, and we ended up down in an old industrial area on the East River where uh, stands uh, the old Domino Sugar 
a factory. And uh, it's an area that's gentrifying, and so they're turning this, they're redeveloping this property uh, into, you know, office towers, <laughs> condominiums, restaurants, retail, the typical thing that we're seeing all over the country. But they're leaving standing uh, this giant old iron edifice. It is enormous. And that's going to be, uh, that was the skin of the old Domino uh, pure grain sugar factory. Some of you, they're still around, right? Domino <laughs> sugar. Uh, I don't buy the sugar. Yeah, but uh, I remember the ads, uh, Domino Pure Sugar. That's how they advertised. They didn't just sell sugar, they sold pure sugar. It was clean, and it was pure, and it was not contaminated. And that's one way for us to look at what Jesus was saying. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are those who keep the whole of their inner uh, state undefiled. They, they are pure at the very center of their being, like domino sugar. But there's another nuance to that word uh, pure, interestingly, that, that is slightly uh, different. Some of you know this, you're Greek students, but it's the idea of, of singleness. It describes that which is unmixed, unadulterated, unalloyed. It's used in Greek literature of water that is pure, of crystal that is clear of pure wheat bread without mix. And it was this meaning of pure about which Martin Lloyd-Jones likened it to something without folds or pleats. Now, in today's fashion, pleats are not quite as in style as they have been at other times. Uh, but you know how with a dress or a blouse or a pair of slacks with pleats, after you've worn the garment a few times, you might look down and see the pleats uh, stretched out a bit, and, and maybe some lint has accumulated uh, inside the folds. You couldn't see it unless you opened the pleat to reveal it, but it was there all along. Uh, the pleat concealed the fact that there was a little more there than met the eye. No pleats on me today. We can see that kind of thing in our relationship with the Lord, can't we? Uh, from a distance uh, or on the surface at certain times, there may appear to all the outside world that we are a flat garment before the Lord, that we have no spiritual uh, lint. Uh, it's all smooth godliness. Your teacher, for example, this morning. <laughs> but we all know better. It was the desire for that kind of purity that caused the psalmist to pray, unite my heart to fear your name. In other words, make it one. Make my heart pure. We can all identify with that. Uh, with one part of my heart, I want to serve God. But with another, sometimes, it seems I desire something entirely different, sadly. And the Apostle Paul, you know, painfully, uh, put it this way in Romans 7, he says he knows the good and he knows the evil and sometimes he doesn't do the good that he wants but the evil that he doesn't want. And Paul says, for I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man but I see a different law in the members of my body. I see Lent in there uh, and we can all identify with that. It's not the kind of thing we like to sort of parade around. We want sincerity. Uh, we despise hypocrisy. I know everyone in this room feels that way. You, you want purity in your life. We want to live our lives both privately and publicly before the eyes of God in plain sight and open before him. But how few of us truly live only one life and live it out in the open for all to see. In my business career, as I increasingly, I found myself in larger companies, not by design, but I did, and getting into these larger companies, you begin to meet with these stated values that large companies often establish. 
to help with the culture of the company. The bigger the company gets, the harder it is to maintain the culture. So you've got these values, cutting edge technology, thought leaders, going the extra mile. And of course, they're all very good cultural values <clears throat> that can lead to success for a company, success in business. But the best one, and one that unfortunately almost every company incorporates into their code of values, is integrity. There they are. One, two, three, four, integrity. It's up on the wall greeting you when you come into the receptionist area. Well, we banty that word integrity about, but it's meaningful. There's root meaning in integral of wholeness or, or oneness. Uh, the most popular definition of integrity that I know, it's what you say or what you do when no one is around. That's integrity. That's when the play is over and the real story unfolds before the only audience that counts. I would never think of using myself as an example from anywhere close to the last 50 years. But I'm quite comfortable talking about my teenage years when uh, one fateful summer, the sweet, godly, church-going, do-gooder got caught with the curtains parted just a little bit to the utter shock of family and friends. Turned out there was more than one side of the young man for the world to see, something quite short of oneness. He had pleats in his life. Well, we all have our stories, and if we belong to the Lord, then we know he will not allow the charade to go on for long. He'll reel us back in. He'll point us to Christ, to Christ who is the only one who was truly pure in heart, heart who has ever lived. To be truly pure in heart is to be like Jesus Christ. That's how we become true in heart. Jesus Christ, who knew no sin, nor was any deceit found in him, nor was any deceit found in him. He was completely pure. And I emphasize that because this is the beatitude. Of the Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the pure in entirety. He doesn't say blessed are the pure in head or blessed are the pure in conduct. This is a point Lloyd-Jones made in his masterful uh, commentary. Uh, intellect and knowledge are very important. Uh, we emphasize that in Believer's Chapel, don't we? We talk about how important it is to know uh, the Bible, to know the Scriptures. But it's possible to have great knowledge and yet be a great danger uh, without purity of heart. It's possible to adhere to strict conduct and follow all kinds of external rules and norms, but have a sterile and empty heart. Uh, the Pharisees had that down to a science, and Jesus spoke about that in this gospel. In Matthew 23, 25, Jesus called them hypocrites because uh, they would clean the outside of a cup or a dish, but inside they were full of robbery and self-indulgence. He said they, uh, famously, I think, he said they were like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside appear beautiful, but inside they're full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. But the truly blessed, according to Jesus, are those who are pure in heart. They're, they're pure in every part of their being. And the promise there in the verse, the, the blessing, according to Jesus, for the pure in heart is that they'll, they shall see God. They shall see God. Now, we might want to ask ourselves a question this morning, first Sunday of 2020. Do we want to see God? That ought to wake you out of your slumber. Do you want to see God? There's a rich history in the Bible concerning the prospect of actually seeing God. It can be summed up in this way. No one can see God and live. No one can see God 
and live. That's a phrase we hear often from biblical characters. I'll mention only Moses. I could mention others. When Moses met up with God unintentionally at the burning bush in the wilderness, the Bible says in Exodus 3 verse 6 that Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look at God. And later in Exodus 33, that scene on Mount Horeb, uh, when Moses asked the Lord to show him his glory, he replied, you cannot see my face, for no one can see me and live. And I, I know you remember that the Lord offered as a concession of sorts to Moses to hide him in the cleft of the rock and cover him with his hand so that the Lord would pass by and Moses would see his back. But my face, the Lord said, shall not be seen. Jesus, in his incarnation, brought the image of God uh, down to mankind. And John is something of the expositor of seeing God. Uh, he talks about it more than any of the gospel writers. Uh, it's a theme of his. In John 1.18, you know this verse, No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. He's taken, he's exegeted him. He's brought him out in the open for everybody uh, to see. In John 5, verse 37, John quoted Jesus as saying, you have neither heard the Father's voice at any time or seen his form. And again, in chapter 6 of John, verse 46, not that anyone has seen the Father, except the one who is from God, he has seen the Father. Now, there is a sense in which uh, it's legitimate to say that we as Christians see God in our lives, in the here and now, somewhat, as, some, somewhat in the same way as I said, that there's a sense that the meek inherit the earth in the, in the here and now. We may see God in nature, for example, or in the events of history, or possibly in the lives of certain people with whom we come into contact. We may see him metaphorically uh, even in the everyday tedium of life. Certain things which transpire seem to give us a special sense of knowing him. You know this verse, Hebrews 11:27. There the author describes uh, the life experiences of Moses and how they were buttressed by his seeing him who is unseen. That's how Moses lived the life that he lived. But all this is nothing. Uh, compared to what will be for us. The Apostle Paul told us that now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. It's one of the most amazing verses in the Bible. Now we see through a glass darkly. Nothing could be more true than that for me, for you. But then face to face. We have a service here tomorrow. Uh, for a man that uh, attended this church with his wife for years and years and years, for decades. Just an, an, another service. There'll be another one after that. And uh, Bill is seeing the Lord now face to face. John wrote, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him, because we will see him just as he is. What Jesus is telling us in the seventh beatitude is that we are blessed because we will see God. And it's truly an astonishing thought. We will see God. But that promise is partially fulfilled even in this life to the degree that we are blessed pure in heart. If we fully understood this, I mean this sincerely, if we fully understood this, it would revolutionize our lives. If I fully understood it, it would revolutionize my life. If that were the animating uh, motivation of our lives, we'd be focused on preparing for that moment. Uh, purity of heart would be a much greater concern uh, for us. I know I've used this illustration from Dr. Walkie before, but it, it fits our beatitude today. There was a businessman who was visited by an angel in a vision who told him he would grant him anything he desired. And 
The man thought about it and quickly responded, give me the pages of the stock exchanges in the Wall Street Journal one year from today. And the angel gave the pages to him, and he thought, this is the bonanza I've been waiting for. I am set for life, except his eye wandered across the page where he saw his photo in the obituary column. <laughs> Dr. Walkie said he lost all interest in the stock market. Do we want to see God? If we do, that's a sober question. If we do, we'll seek more and more in the present time to be pure in heart. The eighth beatitude is the one in verse 9. Let's look at it. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Here's the connection. Much of the conflict in our lives and in the world is birthed by motives that are less than pure. Uh, when hidden agendas and, and selfish ambition rear their ugly heads, it is then that peacemaking comes into play. Peacemaking is a divine work. Uh, its, sentiment, its synonym is reconciliation. And it's what Jesus accomplished when he came to live among us and then die for us. Colossians 1, 19 says that it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of the cross. And further, Paul wrote in Ephesians 2, 14, that he himself is our peace, who made both Jews and Gentiles into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace, and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross. So peacemaking is a divine activity. But peacemaking is also an obligation that the Lord places on each, each of his own. The Beatitude says that plainly, but later Paul would go on in 2 Corinthians 5.19, to write that God was in Christ indeed reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. So this beatitude uh, does not stand alone in, in recommending to the Christian the ministry of reconciliation. It is God's work making peace. It's the devil who is the troublemaker. Uh, it is the devil who uh, was from the beginning entering into the Garden of Eden to make trouble, but God is characterized by the making of peace. So the Christian is to be like God, uh, resolving to be a peacemaker in one's family, uh, at the workplace, in the neighborhood, with the dogs in the neighborhood, with the children in the neighborhood. Uh, even within the church, uh, the Christian has been given the duty of making peace. It's the persistent refrain of the scriptures. I'm going to rattle these off. 1 Corinthians 7:15, God has called us to peace. 1 Peter 3, 10 and 11, <clears throat> the one who desires life to love and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. Hebrews 12, 14, pursue peace with all men. And one of my own personal favorites, because I've leaned upon it often in my own experience in business and in our home, it's Romans 12, 18. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. And this may be for you uh, where peacemaking intersects uh, with meekness. When we determine to be patient with a grievance, perhaps, and seek to lessen tensions and forbear an offense, content to let God govern the outcome. A gentle answer turns away wrath, Proverbs 15, verse 1. But we should consider as well what peacemaking is not, if you see there in your uh, outline, what, it, what is peacemaking not? For, exa for example, Jesus is not uh, just recommending a kind of easygoing attitude. Uh, some people uh, simply aren't wired to be, quote, easygoing, right? Uh, but they can still be peacemakers. I don't think Tiger Woods, for example, is an easygoing 
guy. Uh, that's okay. But even Tiger would admit, I think, that perhaps he could be a better a peacemaker. I don't mean to, to pick on Tiger, but he's a public figure. But some of you are golfers. I know you like to play golf. You like to watch golf. And so you know who Freddie Couples is. Whenever I think of Fred Couples, I think of how he walks down the fairway, the camera on him like he's strolling in a park with his children. He's twirling his, his putter. Uh, he's easygoing. I don't know if he's a peacemaker, but he's easygoing. But being easygoing is not the same thing as a peacemaker. Neither is a peacemaker an appeaser. One may make a sort of temporary peace by surrendering. Neville Chamberlain uh, gives us history's finest example of that. He was Britain's prime minister in the years leading up to World War II, and he desired and loved peace so much that he continually caved in to Hitler's demands until finally, in the end, he got not peace but a world war. And he loved peace, but he was not a peacemaker, and he, his name became synonymous with, with appeasement. There are wrong ways to bring about uh, peace, acquiescing in what is wrong in order to avoid tension, uh, doing anything to avoid possible trouble, uh, not standing up for what is right. All these things may be undertaken in hopes of keeping peace, but they're not what Jesus had in mind when he said, blessed are the peacemakers. But they are what Jesus had in mind, that is what Jesus had in mind when he said, and Matthew records this in Matthew 10, 34, do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. For I came to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and so on. You know that, that, how that verse goes. There are priorities that take precedence over peace on the surface, like standing up for what is right and loving God above loving peace. But here is what true peacemaking may require from us. First, it may be costly. It will take time because it will take you away from other objectives you may have thought needed your attention. It may require humiliation. No one likes to be humiliated. But you may have to humble yourself and apologize. A fresh reminder of the first beatitude. It may inflict pain. Uh, the pain of having to rebuke another when there's no other recourse and in, in a more passive way, peacemaking may require you to actually be peaceable. I, I've alluded to this already, but peacemaking requires, think about this, peacemaking requires that we marshal all the poverty of spirit and meekness and, and purity of heart possible so that we give up on continually looking at everything in terms of its effect on oneself. We must learn the difficult lesson of not being easily offended or even be prepared to suffer wrong or injustice in order that there may be peace. And then actively, the one who makes peace is the one who views things with only one thought of giving glory to God in one's relationships with others. And finally, there is the blessing upon the peacemaker. He is blessed because he has personally known the peace of God and consequently resembles his heavenly Father who has brought peace to him. Such shall be called the sons of God because they bear the family resemblance. You may be called a son or a daughter of God because that's what you have proven yourself to be. Well, this is the last of the Beatitudes that characterize uh, what a Christian should look like. The, the next and last beatitude has to do with, with persecution, what, what ought to happen to a Christian, what does happen to a Christian. But there's some themes that we see in each of these. This won't take long. I'll, I'll mention only two in, in closing. The first is that each of these beatitudes run counter to who we are naturally. They are contrary to nature. They are counterintuitive. They can only be seen in a person who has a new nature and, and thus is supernaturally 
enabled to exhibit uh, these qualities. They are each testaments to the grace of God in our lives, giving to us what we don't have in ourselves and enabling us to manifest conditions that please God and thus bring his blessing. And secondly, each of them reveals contentment. I think this is the main thing I've learned studying the Beatitudes again. Each of them reveals contentment in what God has done for us. There is a merciful decline in self-regard that presupposes each of these Beatitudes and a joyful satisfaction in the gracious will of God for our lives. I had uh, a bowl of cereal yesterday morning. This is a good illustration for me. Maybe not for you, but for me. I had a bowl of cereal. How many bowls of cereal have you sat before? Or oatmeal or toast? And like you, uh, like you I'm sure, I have a habit of saying thank you. Thank you, Lord. But yesterday, for some reason, I paused and I looked at uh, I looked at that bowl of cereal, and I said, "Thank you, Lord. I like cereal. Blueberries on it. Thank you, Lord. You've given me this cereal this day." A bit later in the day in the providence of God. Don't you love the providence of God? A bit later in the day, I was reading a columnist in the paper, in the Wall Street Journal, who mentioned in passing this well-known singer-songwriter who had appeared on The Letterman Show <clears throat> right after having been diagnosed with a, an illness and he knew that he was going to die. And so the conversation must have gotten serious because Letterman asked him <clears throat> what he had learned about life since his diagnosis. <clears throat> and this unbelieving songwriter replied, I, know, I now know how much you're supposed to enjoy every sandwich. God makes demands on us. We don't make demands on God. We belong to him, and he is gracious and good to us beyond all measure. We can be content in that and rejoice in it. Let's pray for that. Father, thank you uh, for uh, these lessons that you give us. You are good to us. You are gracious to us. Uh, Lord, give us the gift of contentment. Uh, they will, that, that gift will be a great instrument of the Holy Spirit in inculcating uh, these uh, beatitudes, these characteristics into our lives. We need to be pure in heart, and we cannot do it of ourselves. Uh, we need to be peacemakers and not constantly fighting to defend ourselves, but have a greater objective in mind. Uh, we need to be satisfied, uh, not only satisfied, we need to rejoice in the circumstances that you put into our lives with faith, believing that you cause them all to work together for good, for those that love you, and we confess, Lord, we do love you. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the great gift uh, that he is to each one of us. And as we embark on a new year, a, a calendar year, you're outside of time. We live in it. Lord, uh, I want to pray your blessings upon each one of us that uh, this year uh, will be more like you, that we will see these beatitudes, these characteristics, and ask ourselves, uh, do we resemble them, and we might be able to say, by the grace of God, more this year. In Jesus' name, amen.